Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, happy, happy to be here. Uh, sorry, I, I had surgery not long ago and uh, uh, I cannot stand, cannot stand uh, too much. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, show you the plan of my talk. Uh, first of all, I'll explain uh, in a minute briefly uh, what is the goal? What, I, what is it that uh, we, want to, uh, we want to achieve? And uh, I'll show you a, uh, a very simple but a bit formal computation, uh, which becomes, in fact, uh, a headache if you try to make uh, rigorous statements about this, uh, about this formal computation. And uh, then uh, I'll show you what I what I had in the background, how I got into this, uh, this formal computation, uh, this came from a work that we did uh, longer, about ten, over 10 years ago with uh, Jean and uh, with uh, Mironescu, that's uh, uh, Bourga, Bredis, and Mironescu. I'll show you uh, an amusing formula. And then we'll come back to the, uh, the new problem, which in fact turns to be much harder than uh, than I had expected. What happened is that after this work, I made a comp this formal computation that I'll show you. Then I thought that would be uh, easily justified and put on, uh, on solid grounds. It turns out to be much, much more complicated. I gave it to his PhD student, and the uh, PhD student had, uh, had a very hard time. And uh, then uh, eventually, uh, eventually there, was, there was much progress. And then, so then I'll return to the uh, original question. And uh, then I got, I got extremely interested uh, over the past uh, year or two in this kind of problem uh, because I learned uh, from people who are in uh, image processing that there are questions, and in fact very difficult questions, in image processing which are almost similar to, the, uh, to, the, to this difficult question that, uh, that I started with. Uh, so uh, let me flash very quickly a uh, list of references that I'll mention. I'll uh, just flash it quickly. Uh, so the first uh, two, three are related to this work that I'll, uh, I'll show you in a few minutes with, uh, with Jean and uh, Mironescu. And uh, it really starts with a very simple question about how you recognize that function, some functions with values into the integers are constant functions. Uh, then uh, we had left one case open uh, dealing with DZ, uh, and this was uh, answered by uh, Juan Davila. Uh, also contribution by uh, Augusto Ponce, and then quite a series of uh, very interesting papers of uh, Oaimin Guyen, uh, who is this uh, student to whom I gave, and uh, uh, he, he really made a very interesting major contribution. At some point he was stuck. We asked Jean, and uh, Jean had to crack the, uh, the problem. And then uh, the last two references are recent. This is joint work of mine with uh, Nguyen. OK, so let me explain the problem, or the, uh, what, what it is that we want to, uh, want to achieve. Uh, so omega is uh, a domain in Rn, smooth bounded, or you can take also omega to be all of Rn, that's uh, uh, both cases are of interest. And uh, I want to point out that already when n equals 1, 1D, there are already uh, difficulties and uh, often, or quite often, if you solve the problem in 1D, if you understand the problem in 1D, uh, then uh, you get there is a chance that you'll understand it in a higher dimension. Uh, so here it is. You fix a function phi uh, defined on uh, zero infinity, a non-negative function. 
And uh, you consider, I'll tell you in a, in a few minutes what kind of functions phi uh, I have in mind. And uh, you, you look at the uh, functional lambda of u, which is uh, the integral over omega cross omega of phi of u of x minus u of y. u is your uh, generic function defined on omega, real valued function. And then uh, you divide this by uh, x minus y to the n plus 1, n is a dimension. And uh, in fact, what you do, you take this uh, functional, but then you uh, rescale it with a parameter delta. Uh, you put one delta in front and another delta under u of x minus u of y. Uh, this is, you don't touch. And uh, you have to think of delta as a small, small parameter. And uh, the goal, not so, not so obvious why, but in fact, I'll show you, I'll show you this uh, formal computation that lambda delta, this functional lambda delta for a general class of phi converges as delta goes to zero to the uh, BV norm, or what you call it, the total variation, the integral of the great absolute value of the gradient of u. It's a bit of an unusual, uh, unusual computation, but you'll see that once you, once you catch it, once you tackle it the right way, uh, it's clear why that expression uh, resembles the, uh, the total variation. And uh, then that's the, so that's the first goal. But you'll see it's not so clear in what sense you have convergence for what functions. The natural class, of course, would be, uh, for example, if you have functions for which the right-hand side makes sense, that is, for example, W11 or BV functions, then you hope that this will converge to the, uh, to the natural quantity for all functions u. Well, you see there are surprises. And, uh, and then, so this is the first, first goal, to study this, uh, uh, this class of functionals as delta goes to zero. And then the next goal is to apply this to this type of problem, uh, minimization problem, uh, lambda times the integral of f minus u squared plus capital lambda delta of uh, u, where f is a given function. And this is the kind of uh, problems which, are, uh, which occur in, uh, in image processing. OK, now the, let me immediately point out that the interesting examples of functions phi are functions which are <coughs> not convex. And that's one of the major source of uh, difficulties here. Uh, phi is definitely not convex, so that the, the functional lambda is not, definitely not, not convex. And uh, this is a source of, a major source of, uh, of difficulty. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. This is the, uh, yeah, there are, there are, there are lots of uh, models in, uh, in image processing, the Manfold Chai and so forth, yes. In the same, yes, yes, there are a lot of models, and uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll mention the, the exact models that I have in mind. In it. But this is definitely reminiscent, yes. Uh, OK, now the, let me give you the standard assumptions that I'm going to make on the function phi, and then I'll, I'll show you some, uh, some examples, uh, typical examples. Phi is a function which starts near the origin like t squared was bounded at least by a constant times uh, t squared. It's fully bounded on the, and it's also fully bounded on the whole line. So here are some typical examples, and uh, maybe I'll write them on the blackboard so that we can, uh, we can keep them. Each, each of those uh, function has a different, uh, well, some have different uh, flavor, but those are the examples to keep in mind. And uh, so the first one is a function which is exactly t squared. 
up to one, and then it's identically equal to one. Uh, the, uh, another example is a function which is like near t equals zero. This is like t squared, and then it goes uh, asymptotically to one very quickly. Uh, another function uh, is uh, the heavy side function. Uh, the functions phi that have in mind are usually continuous, but this kind of function is also acceptable and uh, and interesting. And in fact, it was this function, the the, the computation that I gave to uh, uh, to Nguyen for the, was for this function, this lambda delta of u is a double integral. In this case, for this functional, you see, is a double integral of one over x minus y squared to the n uh, x minus y to the n plus one integrated on the set where u of x minus u of y is a bigger than delta. Uh, also, you can keep in mind uh, the function, uh, a function phi, which would be uh, C infinity with uh, compact support. And uh, another example, which is also quite interesting, uh, and there are many open problems with this kind of uh, function, is t squared up to one and then something which decays to uh, zero, either like one over t to a power or like an exp exponential decay uh, as, t goes to, uh, as t goes to infinity. Okay, maybe I'll just write them on the blackboard so that you can, uh, you can if, and I'll refer to those, to those functions later on. So phi one, Phi one and phi two are really the models which occur in, uh, in image processing. So this is t squared and then one. Phi two is uh, one minus t to the minus t squared. So it looks like this. Near t equals zero, it's like t squared and then it goes asymptotically to one. And uh, then we have phi three is the heavy side function. Uh, zero here and one here. Uh, phi four would be any function, say C infinity with compact support. And uh, phi five would be uh, say T squared, for example, and then something positive and going uh, decaying to zero, either very fast or slowly. And okay. So uh, let me show you this strange computation, kind of, but very suggestive. I don't know if you call it strange or a bit uh, unusual, uh, uh, which uh, says that, so this is the first proposition, if you take, so it's kind of a formal computation, that is everything is smooth, uh, things go very well. Uh, take, for example, a function u, which is c1, c infinity with uh, compact support. Then I claim that uh, the lambda delta of u, this uh, non-local functional, converges to the uh, total variation times a constant, uh, which is explicitly, which I wrote explicitly down here. Uh, depends on phi, it's the integral from zero to infinity of phi of s over s squared ds. That's why in all the examples you always see that uh, near the origin phi is flat enough so that this integral near the origin converges and no problem near infinity, the integral converges because phi is always bounded. And then you have the integral on, this is a constant depending on the dimension, the integral on the sphere of uh, sigma dot e. e is any vector, any unit vector on the sphere. For example, you can take the, inter the, the, the vector which has just component one and then zero, zero, zero. It's independent, this, this constant is independent of the choice of the vector e on the sphere just by invariance of rotation. And uh, very often, I, I mean, in the, uh, well, let's say throughout the talk, I'm going to 
assume the, that we have the normalization condition that this constant is one. So it means that don't take very seriously the example that I have there. Uh, if it does not satisfy the normalization condition, you just multiply it by just multiply it by constant. But it's good to keep in to 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 make this normalization condition. Okay, so here is the uh, this computation, very simple. First of all, you have uh, the, so it's the integral member over all of omega, but you can split it in two pieces. The integral where x minus y is less than delta to the alpha, and where it's bigger <laughs> than delta to the alpha. And alpha, uh, I'll show you how to choose it in a minute. So you have 1 plus 2, the two parts of this integral. And I claim that the second part will go to 0. You can neglect it. So in fact, we'll keep only, we'll study only the, uh, the first integral. Uh, and so because what you do is uh, you see if x minus y is bigger than delta to the alpha, <coughs> 1 over x minus y to the n plus 1 is less than 1 over delta to the alpha times n plus 1. So if you make this, if you choose alpha small enough so that this holds, then uh, inside the integral you have just phi of ux minus uy, which is a bounded quantity. So for example, the domain is bounded. Then And so this delta make the whole thing uh, go to zero. This, I mean, this second integral. OK, so now let's work with the, let's look at the first, the first term. OK, and here I uh, just want to show you the, 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 the bit of the, the details. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's there is nothing, uh, nothing complicated in this computation. Uh, because, you see, we can take x minus x minus y small. You can do a Taylor's expansion after you have uh, changed the variable. So you call y is x plus h. And uh, so u of x plus h minus u of x becomes h dot gradient of u of x. And so just I'm cheating a little bit. I'm replacing, and I'm, but I'm making a small error. I'm replacing this, this here, this uh, difference, ux plus h, u of x plus h minus u of x by h dot the gradient of u at x. OK, and uh, now I use polar coordinates to compute this, uh, to compute this integral. H, h so far is a, is a vector. And uh, so I write r times sigma. r is the modulus of h. And uh, sigma is the point, uh, is h over modulus of h. So it's uh, on the sphere. And uh, so you look at, you just rewrite this integral as uh, we keep the delta. Uh, r goes from 0 delta to the alpha. And then I'm just rewriting the, uh, what I have inside the, inside the function phi. And then I have, uh, because uh, I have a dh, which is r to the n minus 1 dr, and I divide by r to the n plus 1. So I'm just left with n, uh, with n r squared. And now I uh, change, I make a change of variable. I rescale the variable that I have here, the variable r, and I replace this by the variable s. So this will become an s. And then I have a c of s over s squared. And then I have the, this term here from the change of variable, which uh, pops out. That's the integral of sigma dot the gradient of u of x. But of course, you see, if you have any vector z, and you, took, you take the integral over sigma on the sphere of sigma dot v, what you get is the length of v times some uh, times some constant. So the length of v is now the uh, the length of the gradient of u of x, and so that's it. Finish finish this uh, formal computation. So you you see that the uh, first part of the integral one sub delta behaves like a constant times the uh, total variation, 
and the constant is precisely this number times this integral on the, uh, this, this number which just depends, depends on n. Okay, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't like uh, VV norms or W11 and prefer the uh, Sobolev norm, W1P, you can do a very similar computation and end up with the W1P norm. Uh, namely, what you do, what you just follow the same formal, same formula computation and uh, you just replace in front, you replace the delta that we had in front of the integral by delta to the p, and here x minus y that we had to the n plus one by x minus y to the n plus p, and the same kind of, uh, same kind of manipulation tells you that the limit as delta goes to zero of uh, lambda delta for this lambda delta is the Sobolev norm, the W1P Sobolev norm with some uh, explicit, explicit constant. Okay, so first question, as I said, uh, can you make this computation that I just showed you very formal for a function u which is nice do you have a similar result is a function phi is a function u phi is one of those functions so phi is smooth and etc but u i want u to be uh, not c1 a little rough so for example w11 and from this formal computation very often if all the quantities which appear there make sense you would expect that for functions u in w11, so first derivative in L1, and maybe even for functions in bv, you would have that the limit of lambda delta is up to this normalization constant, which I take one, is exactly the integral of uh, absolute value of the gradient of u. So, First thing, bad news. Uh, this is simply not true. And it's strange that it's not true. It's a bit, bit of a shock uh, because you expect it to converge to the integral uh, absolute, value and absolute value of the gradient of u. One can construct, and this was done by uh, Augusto Ponce, a function even in 1D, not terribly complicated. You can construct a function u which is in W11 and such that the uh, lambda delta of u converges to plus infinity when you expect it to remain bounded, etc. cetera, not, not true. So that's, that's a very bad news. Uh, now, good news. Good news is that uh, you see this mode of convergence, which would be the natural mode of convergence, the pointwise convergence, that is lambda delta of u tends to the integral of gradient of u for all functions u in W11 is not the right mode of convergence. And the right mode of convergence here turns out to be the gamma convergence in the sense of the Giorgi. And I'll explain for those of you who are not familiar with gamma convergence, what this is. And if you turn to gamma convergence, indeed, the functionals lambda delta converge, their gamma limit is the total variation. Except there will be a surprise. It can be not exactly the total variation, it's the multiple of the total variation. And it could be, for example, one half of the integral of gradient absolute value of u, that's very surprising. And so this is, this is the kind of things which I will, I will discuss, this gamma convergence. And so the other good news is that this kind, this kind of analysis, those kind of functionals occur in image processing. And so it's absolutely worth 
studying this kind of this kind of problem uh, rigorously. Sure. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's all related, and w well, we're going to see. There are two bad. I'll give you a cousin functional, another functional, which is convex, and where good things happen. The lack of convexity here creates really. Uh, th there are two things which are bad in some sense in this functional, and I'll discuss one of them is the lack of convexity. Absolutely. That's one of the that's one of the best things. Indeed. Indeed. If I were to replace the phi by this quadratic, then I would not have any problems. It's just the negative use would not be present. That's uh, that's 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 co that's correct. Okay. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes. And I'll show you in fact some of the functionals which uh, which would be convex, quadratic, and also I mean there are there are really two bad things about this functional. One of them is that you d one of them is a lack of convexity, and I'll explain somehow where it enters, where uh, at what point one would use convexity to prove good things. Okay, I'll, uh, I, I'm sure you see some of see some of those things, but uh, I'll I'll put my finger exactly where convexity would help enormously, and secondly is the lack of bound. That is, even if you take, and that's a bit strange, it's not quite related to convex, not quite related to convexity, but you see, even take u nice, like we had, t1 function, t1 with compact support, say. Okay. We know that lambda delta of u converges to the integral of gradient of u. So you may ask, do you have a bound for lambda delta of u? Can you show that lambda delta of u, because its limit is exactly the integral of gradient u, can you show that it's bounded by a million times the integral of gradient of u? Okay. And this is wrong, just wrong even for uh, smooth functions. With uh, So there are two things going bad in this, uh, two things going bad in this problem. I, I must confess that uh, I must, it's, it's, it's really, we started with another model uh, with uh, with Jean, and uh, uh, about ten years ago, I, I'll show you the I'll show you the other functional that uh, that we studied and how we how we encountered the other functional. And I must say, this functional, I just cooked it. I just cooked it, and I made this formal computation ten years ago. And I was ready, and I was giving it to PhD students, and I was telling them, mimic, please mimic what we had done. And they had lots of they had lots of trouble, and so at some point when this counterexample when uh, Ponce sh uh, came out with this counterexample, I I was ready to leave this out and uh, to abandon. The, I, I thought the problem is 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 rotten. There is nothing one can nothing interesting one can prove, and then it then it occurred to me maybe something else. Might uh, would be uh, would be provable, not the pointwise convergence, but the gamma convergence, another mode of convergence. And this took a long, long time, but eventually Guyenne made a breakthrough on this, showing indeed in one example, in fact, in the heavy side case of a heavy side function, he proved that's a remarkable paper. He proved that one has a gamma convergence and. Using lots of the technology he developed for the uh, for this uh, for this uh, for this function, which we call, call, call this five phi, uh, phi three, uh, this uh, heavy side function, using lots of the machinery that he developed, then we, we were able to show things for general functions phi, especially the interesting functions of phi one and uh, phi one and phi two. Okay. Guyenne, I'm sorry. Yes, that's uh, who I mean. Guyenne, yes, who is uh, very, very strong. And, uh, you know him. Okay. So I'm going to open a big parenthesis, and uh, it's about another functional that we studied, where things that we had studied with Jean, where things go beautifully. There are no problems. It's a convex functional. You have bounds, etc. 
And, uh, and but let me tell you a little bit of the story because how we got into the how we got involved in this functional because it's, it's an amusing story and uh, it didn't start with the study of those functional. It started with a very simple question. Uh, you take a function u, so forget about this functional lambda delta. We'll come back, come back in a, in a, in a few minutes to that. But you start with the following question. You take a function u on a domain omega, which is integer valued. And, uh, and uh, oh, for example, omega could be a ball, if you like. It's not uh, it's basically interesting uh, for balls. And uh, you ask the question, can, under what conditions can you conclude that the function is constant? I mean AE, right? That there, there is one constant such that U equals AE, that constant. Of course, you will tell me, uh, well, you must take U to be, you must take U continuous because uh, otherwise you build immediately a contraexample. Yes, indeed, the standard answer is that U is continuous, then uh, then U is uh, then U is constant. But I want to convince you that this is in some sense, one possibility. There are many other possibilities. And at that point, and I'll, ask, I'll raise that question uh, later, it's not clear what is the, what is the common roof. I can, I'll give you several, several uh, answers. It's not clear what is the, uh, what is the common roof. There, there's probably one, and uh, OK. So let me give you one answer. And it came. Uh, that question, you, you ask me why did we, why were we, we interested in this question, is because uh, with, uh, with Jean we were interested in lifting functions. You have a function u which has modulus 1, you write it as e to the i something, and you want to know whether you have uniqueness of the lifting. So if you take two liftings, say psi 1 and psi 2, divide by 2, divide by two pi, you have a function exactly which has the property that it's uh, defined on omega. It takes its value. Uh, it takes its values into the integer. Can you say that uh, basically there is uniqueness of the lifting in classes of functions which are not necessarily continuous? So here is one class. Here is one condition where uh, one can prove. So here it is. It's a very simple condition and has nothing to do with continuity. And nevertheless, you can, you can uh, get from that condition that the function u is identically equal to a constant. The integral of the double integral of u of x minus u of y to the power p, any p uh, bigger than 1, divided by x minus y to the n plus 1. If this integral is finite and u has values into the integer, then u is identically equal to a constant. Straight, right? A bit, uh, but it gave us, our, our goal was to have functions which were, for example, in the fractional Sobolev space. And this tells you that if you have functions in some fractional Sobolev space, w1, p, w, for example, h1 half, any dimension, h1 half function, so h1 half can be badly discontinuous. Any functions in h1 half with values into the integer uh, must be uh, a constant. OK, so we prove this, uh, we prove this result. And in fact, uh, the way we proved it is a bit funny. What we, what we used is another fact, and uh, here it has nothing to do with the uh, integers. If you have a function with values into the real, which satisfy the same, same inequality, except here you take the power 1 instead of p, like we had before, then the function u is identically equal to a constant. The other statement is not true for function, for real valued function it would be, but with p equals 1, it turns out not only to be, I mean, it's true, and it implies the other thing, because if you have a function which takes its values into the integer, either u of x minus u of y is 0, 
or it's one, two, etc. And then this quantity is bigger than this quantity. So if one the other integral is finite, this integral must be also finite, and then you can apply you can apply this this result. So uh, we had uh, we had given in fact a nice exercise. You can uh, try. I'm sure now by now there are quite a number of proofs for that. Uh, just take it home. Uh, probably after one or two hours, uh, you'll end up with a proof of this uh, of this statement. Uh, but uh, that's that's not 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 terribly difficult to find at least one proof. Uh, but what's funny is that uh, we were working on that, and one day uh, Jean came. Uh, came. We were working with uh, 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 Jean and uh, with uh, Mironescu, and uh, Jean came and he said, "I have, I have a better result." He said, "Instead of n plus one, let's take n plus one minus epsilon." Let's compute this integral. And for example, if u is smooth, that integral is finite because on the top you have x minus y, and here you have, you see, uh, x minus y to the power n plus 1 minus epsilon. So this is integrable, and the integral for a general, say, a general smooth function is of the order of 1 over epsilon. And uh, Jean said, well, if it's little o of 1 over epsilon, then the function u must be constant. Nice statement. And uh, as usual, Jean had a very complicated, uh, very complicated proof that we couldn't quite, uh, quite, quite grasp. And we're, we're fooling, around with this, uh, fooling around with this statement. And uh, eventually, we managed, to, we managed to prove it through a funny route. Let me show you, and then we'll come back a few minutes to the OK, so here is a statement that I want to prove. Let me show you one, so we'll make a little bit of an excursion, because the way we'll prove it now is to say, first of all, the function is BZ. A function like this must be BZ. Even if it's capital O of 1 or epsilon, the function u must be bz. And we'll see that its derivative in the uh, bz sense must be 0. Bit of a funny thing, because we start, we have to start with u is just measurable. We have absolutely no differentiability. OK, uh, so we make a statement which will make the whole thing much more natural. You take a sequence of mollifiers, which are radial mollifiers. Uh, so this is, uh, they are normalized by the integral equals 1. And uh, of course, like good mollifiers, they should tend to 0 away from, away from the origin. And now you consider this functional. So the, this functional is, we didn't have a function phi. It's a bit different uh, than, the, uh, than, the other, than the one that we, we consider considered before. So it's the double integral u of x minus u of y divided by x minus y times rho epsilon, this mollifier evaluated at x minus y. And uh, the claim is that this phi epsilon converges to the total variation. In fact, this is true in a very, let me, let me make the, uh, the following statement. So phi epsilon is this functional. Phi 0 will be the limiting functional, but let me just take this as a definition. This is the some constant times the, uh, total, ma the uh, total variation. If u is in bz, and I take this to be plus infinity if u is just a, uh, an L1 function. And uh, the point is that phi epsilon of u, the limit for any function u in L1, the limit of this double integral, of this double integral, is the phi 0. OK. That's not, if you look at, if you see this statement, now it's not so surprising. Now you, you see this one, 
uh, it's very intuitive why this should converge, because you have this, uh, this ratio u of x minus u of y over x minus y. That's like a derivative, more or less. And uh, you are squeezing uh, x should be close to y, because you have this, uh, you have this mollifier here. OK. Uh, no, and as I said, this has two statements. There are two statements in this, uh, in this uh, there are two assertions in this, uh, in this theorem. One is that if u is in BV, then you have the convergence. Okay? So here there is no problem. We don't see the problem that we had if, if, if you do. Uh, first of all, the way you can do it, you, take, you make a formal computation, Taylor's expansion, et cetera, exactly like we had done before. And you'll see why the, uh, that here it's quite easy, why uh, this integral, this double integral converges to the, uh, converges to the total variation. OK. And uh, now, and this is where uh, I'm answering your, your question, Tom, about if conversely, if we know that this remains bounded as epsilon goes to 0 along a sequence going to 0, then the function u uh, must be bv. OK. Uh, as I said, first of all, the way you prove this theorem is uh, you first take u to be uh, smooth. Then it's very easy. Then uh, you use this bound. You have this bound, that phi epsilon, and that's what, uh, where I said that uh, there are two things which are missing with the lambda delta. This bound, which is an easy bound. Uh, you have this bound for any function u. Okay? And, uh, and then the kind, so you first prove it for smooth function, and then, uh, and then you do it by kind of density arguments for general, for general BV functions. And uh, the second part is more delicate because, so you see, you have a function u. I tell you nothing about this function u. It can be awfully bad, can be uh, just measurable. I just know that this uh, phi epsilon remains bounded as epsilon goes to zero. And I claim the function u must be bv. So how do you try to pass to the limit uh, in epsilon when you have no differentiability for the function u? And here is the way it was. In fact, well, we had we had we had one one argument, but then uh, Eli Stein came with uh, a very natural argument, which is really very clean. And he said, use the convexity here. The function phi phi epsilon of u is convex in u. Okay. So if we have a bound, you have the same bound for all the mollified versions of u by convexity. Here, convexity enters. And now you, what you do is you fix this gamma, which is the mollified version of uh, mollified version of u. Now, because u gamma is smooth, you can pass to the limit and infer that this, the total variation of u gamma is bounded independently of gamma, and that's it. You get that u is in BV. Okay. Now. What does it have to do with the, uh, the original question that I asked about functions, which are how do you prove that functions are, some functions are constant with this little o of 1 over epsilon? So here is a choice, an unusual choice of a mollifier. It's epsilon divided by r to the n minus epsilon. This, I claim, is a mollifier. Now, you see, away from, uh, away from 0, it goes to 0. And if you compute the integral, it just because here it's uh, the integral uh, will be of the order of 1 over epsilon, because you have Rn minus 1, et cetera. OK, so you have 1 over epsilon, but you kill this epsilon by putting the epsilon there. So this is, this is a sequence of mollifier. And if you introduce this in the theorem, you just get that this limit, this bit, this was not, this is not so standard, a bit unusual, that this limit as epsilon goes to zero, because we have rewritten it now uh, as u of x minus u of y divided by x minus y, et cetera, is exactly the, uh, the total variation. And so in particular, if we know that this is little o of 1 over epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero, uh, you get that function u, first of all, is in bv, because it's 
uh, bounded, and then you get that the gradient of u is, its gradient in the BD sense is uh, zero, so the function u is uh, constant. Now you can do, or you can take uh, your standard choice of, uh, standard choice of mollifiers, and uh, from that, for example, this one, your, I mean your favorite mollifier, and you'll see that you can cook lots of functionals which are going to converge to the, the total variation. Okay, uh, let me just quickly mention uh, two things. First of all, uh, there are, from what this, this formula that we had, there are lots of variants of this formula. Here is one of them. Uh, it's so instead of u of x minus u of y over x minus y, here you put a power q, and then you take the, you raise the whole thing to the power one over q, it also converges to the uh, total variation. And I mention this because in a few minutes we'll see that this kind of functional occurs in uh, image, image processing. Uh, let me mention also, uh, even though it doesn't play really a major role, but it's a useful fact that those functionals, phi epsilon, they converge to the total variation not only pointwise, as we saw for every function u in bz, et cetera, but they also converge to the bz, uh, to the BZ uh, norm uh, in the, the geology sense of gamma convergence. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, gamma convergence, I have rewritten the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the definition here uh, for any, so it's gamma converges in L1 if for any function u in L1 and for any sequence un converges. You see, it's, uh, it's a concept which is very interesting because it takes into account the uh, values of the sequence phi n in neighboring points of, uh, of, a fun of, a point of, of u. So the lim int should be greater than phi zero. And the second property is that for any u, you can construct, usually by brute force, one sequence converging to u such that the limb soup is less than or equal than, the, than phi zero. And uh, Augusto Ponce proved that phi epsilon is not, not that's fairly easy here, uh, phi epsilon converges to phi zero in the sense of gamma convergence and not just pointwise convergence. Okay. Uh, just one little digression uh, about those functions. So now I gave, gave you proof. So now you can, uh, using this, you can, uh, you can prove that functions with values into the integer satisfying this double integral being finite and even better must be, must be constant. Uh, let me, here I'm just a little digression because uh, if any of, some of you might, uh, might be uh, might here, I, I need help, I'm not, not too satisfied. Here, uh, you see, as I said, you can, the same statement that is the natural statement function which is continuous with values into the integer is constant. In fact, just uh, basically uh, just relying on that, you can go one step further and say that VMO functions, vanishing mean oscillation uh, functions, which are taking their values into the integers, are constant. Another class, unrelated, is that if you have functions in W11, Sobolev space, W11, if they take their values into the integer, they must be constant. Roughly speaking, because here you have a derivative and you show that the derivative must be, must be zero because the function takes its values into the, into, the, uh, into the integer. And what we just proved is, for example, functions in H1 half. Now, we have three classes. It has nothing to do with each other. Continuous, say, or VMO, W11, H1 half. Okay? They all give you this conclusion. And uh, I don't know what is a common roof, how we can, uh, and uh, for example, one, one question, I don't know the answer. If you take a function which you can split as the sum of three functions, one in VMO, the other one 
W11. Third one is a H1 half. And you know that the sum, take his values into the integer, is it true that the function is constant or not? I don't know. Uh, we can prove it if we uh, take the sum of two functions in one of those classes, but for three, we are not, uh, we are lost. No, no. Yeah. Yes, any discrete set, of course, of course. Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. No, the, the integers are just an example of. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. That's a good question. I have to think about it. Give you the answer. Probably what can describe you. Uh, sorry, I cannot. Uh, it's a good question. Yes. Okay. So now, after this uh, long digression, let me go back to those functional lambda delta that I started with. And uh, as I said, we'll make the, the basic assumptions, behavior near zero, like uh, at most uh, t squared, but it could be completely flat, for example, and uh, bounded phi and this uh, normalization condition. And uh, as I showed you, just this was this formal computation. We know that uh, the limit of lambda delta of u is the total variation with the constant one here, because we have the normalization condition. Okay. And uh, as I said, the natural question is: uh, Is it true for w11? And for w11, all we can say is that the lim int, and this is a bit similar to the computation I showed you before. If you have a function u in w11, the lim int of lambda delta of u is greater than or equal than the expected, uh, the expected right-hand side. And uh, as I said, the strict inequality may occur. This guy might even tend to infinity for functions in w11. So that's this uh, construction of uh, Augusto, Augusto function. So here you see a major difference between the two functionals, phi epsilon, both converging to the total variation for phi epsilon had a very good life. And because the convexity, et cetera, we could, uh, we could prove lots of things. Here we don't have convexity, and that's one of the reasons we cannot say that if, for example, if this is let me show you one, one, still one result. But it turns out to be quite difficult to prove. Un unlike this argument that we had using convexity and mollifiers with, uh, 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 here is one, one, uh, one very nice result of, uh, of Jean Bourguin and uh, Guyenne. Suppose, for example, that the this quantity remains bounded as delta goes to zero. Can you prove that the function u is in BV? And the answer is yes, indeed, this is true. Uh, and you have a bound on the, on the BV norm by this. Surprisingly, the proof, because of the lack of convexity, and so this result is correct, it requires some additional condition that uh, at infinity, phi should be positive. I mean, you should have a, a lower bound for phi. So this is like in the example of phi 1, phi 2, uh, phi 3. You have, you have 1 at infinity, but it fails for uh, phi 4 and phi 5. Phi goes, to, phi goes to 0. And then it's not known, there are no contraexamples, for example, for phi for the function uh, phi, phi, no contraexample whether this is true or not. It does fail when phi has compact dipole. So this conclusion, so this requires this, uh, this condition. And this is, despite the fact that it's a natural statement, the proof is quite, uh, it's, uh, the proof, proof is quite, uh, quite tricky. Okay, now let's get to gamma convergence. So here is a result which is probably the, uh, one of the main results that we have so far. Uh, 
assume that phi satisfy what I call the basic conditions, near zero, normalization, and so forth. Okay. But not necessarily uh, bounded below at infinity. So all the functions that you see there on the blackboard, they will satisfy. They will satisfy the, the, the they satisfy the, the basic conditions. Then the functional lambda delta converge, gamma converge to a limit, which is the natural limit that you expect, which is the, uh, the total variation, except there is a mysterious constant, really a very mysterious constant, which pops in into the problem, a constant k. So here is a statement. You can the gamma converge to k times the uh, total variation for some mysterious constant between, which is between 0 and 1, depending only on the function phi, does not depend on the domain, etc. Okay? And this uh, constant there, k, uh, is strictly positive, so that's a good, uh, good thing, is strictly positive if you have this additional condition that phi at infinity uh, is, uh, is, bounded, is bounded below at infinity. Now, uh, I will not say anything about the proof. Proof is very, is really very tricky, and uh, it uses lots of the technology uh, which uh, Nguyen had developed for the heavy side function, where he was the first one to prove that such a result uh, holds uh, for the uh, phi, phi three, and he now a very interesting open problem is what can we say about this constant k? No, there is always, there is always, no, no, it does not, no, no, it's not that either it goes to infinity. No, okay, let me, let me, uh, let me say the statement, let me write, let me, so this lambda naught, well, it's, it's infinity, but if we work, say, in the BV class, just within the framework of the BV, so you have this, l let me take this as a definite, lambda naught is, uh, so, I mean, I, Maybe I, I, I should not have said no when you said it either goes to infinity. So if the function u is not bv, then it does go to infinity, okay? But if the function u is bv, if the function u is bv, you don't have any more this phenomenon that lambda delta, I mean, lambda delta of u can go to infinity, but you can, so in the example of Ponce, lambda delta of u goes to infinity. Let, let me show you a picture here which I made. Show you a picture. Because it's very counterintuitive. It's very, it's very surprising. So here's a function u. It's not a function u which, which uh, Augusto, Augusto Ponce wrote down because for that function it goes to uh, lambda delta of u converges to infinity. Here, for that function u, because it's a nice function, lambda delta of u converges to uh, the integral of the gradient of u, absolute value of the gradient of u. What you can do is you take your function u, you play, you wiggle it a little bit, you construct in this way a sequence of functions converging to u, and the lambda delta of u delta, they converge maybe to one half of this. This is very counterintuitive because you would think that by introducing uh, wigglings, uh, you are going to increase to increase the value. Here you can decrease it. It's quite uh, quite uh, quite surprising. And uh, unfortunately, there is very little information about this. Uh, what what is the value of this uh, constant? Yes, 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 exactly, correct, correct. Now, it would be very interesting uh, to get some information about this constant k. For example, I have the conjecture that no matter what phi, in all the examples that we have there, 
the constant k will be strictly less than 1, will be strictly less than 1. For example, uh, Nguyen was able to prove for the heavy side function that it is indeed strictly less than 1. Probably true for any function. No idea how to no idea how to prove it. And if it's not true, I would love to see for which function it is it is equal to it is equal to one. Okay. Uh, also can you, for example, for the function uh, phi four, the one with compact support, one can show that k is zero. Okay. Can you characterize we don't know what is k for the function phi five. When you have some decay, some decay at, uh, at infinity, we don't know whether it's zero or whether it's a positive number. Okay, uh, now let me, I know we're, we're late. Uh, let me, but I do want to say a few words now about the, uh, the relations to, uh, to image processing. And in fact, for, for the purpose of image processing, it would be interesting to decide whether the constant k is zero or whether it's strictly positive equal to one, less than one, etc. Okay, so uh, I'll, go, I'll go a little quick. Now, can I take five, five minutes? Okay. So uh, here is a crash, crash course in image processing, just a few minutes. Uh, so uh, it's really a major industry. Uh, I, can, uh, I can flash some, uh, some references if I can find them, uh, some references about image processing. Uh, no, I don't find my, uh, my list of references. Uh, sorry? You have a survey. Yes, there is a, there is a very interesting survey uh, by uh, Boades Paul Morel. Morel is in one of the leaders in France, uh, I mean, uh, worldwide on uh, image processing. And they have a survey paper in the in the uh, in the version uh, from 2005 there are 42 references just to give you an idea how the subject is expanding and uh, there was a uh, it was reprinted uh, a few years later in 2010 and uh, with minor uh, additions and there they had already 100 uh, 100 references so here is the uh, the strategy you you have an image a poor image it has arrived, you know, by transmission. The image can be distorted and so forth. So you have the, a poor image, measure of poor quality, f of x. How do you improve its quality? You choose a filter, f, which is a functional, and you minimize this functional, integral over omega of f minus u squared plus capital F of u. And uh, this lambda here, we have a parameter. Lambda is called the fidelity parameter because uh, you see if you take lambda very large, so you divide, it's like dividing by one over lambda. If lambda goes to infinity, you don't see the filter anymore. And so you just have f equals u when you try to minimize. So that's, you have not improved the image, but it's exactly is the fidelity is excellent because it's exactly like your bad image. So you have a trade-off between uh, between the two between the two things, and you choose empirically usually how you want the uh, how you want the uh, the lambda. Okay, and f is also again a filter empirically chosen, and there are lots of uh, lots of models. If you want, you can go to this uh, survey paper, and uh, there are three uh, popular. Uh, filters. Uh, one of the most popular filter is called the Roth filter. Uh, it's Rudin. It's not the Rudin of the, the function analysis, uh, but Osher is the Osher from uh, UCLA and uh, Fatemi. Uh, simply take the total variation, the integral of absolute value of the gradient of u, and you minimize this, and they tell you that the minimizer u is better quality than the original the original image f. So that's one, one possibility, just the total variation. Another possibility, and this has been uh, the uh, filters of uh, Gilboa and Osher from uh, 2007, and Aubert and uh, Kontrop uh, from 2009. Uh, those guys, they knew already our work with uh, Jean, with Jean Bourguin about phi epsilon. So they said, instead of 
the total variation, integral of gradient of absolute value of u. Let's take this non-local functional that I showed you, phi epsilon, and let's try to minimize. And in fact, it gives, gives nice results, uh, which are competitive with the uh, other, other models. So what's very nice about this, we have a convex functional. You have a unique minimizer for that. And as epsilon goes to 0, it converges because of the gamma convergence theory and so forth. This uh, minimizer converges to the minimizer of the Roth problem because roughly speaking in the limit here you have the uh, integral of gradient, absolute value of the gradient of u. Now, uh, Gilboa and Osher, uh, without knowing anything about the work that we had done with, uh, with Jean and with Mironescu, they took this guy, which is also a convex, nice convex functional, which I told you we can prove goes to the integral of the gradient of u. This is just a variant of what we had with, uh, with Jean. And they said, let's minimize that. And they have good results. So here, no problem. You have a minimizer, and the minimizer converges as epsilon goes to 0 to the Roth. Now, in practice, the guys who are doing uh, computation, they fix the epsilon. They don't let epsilon go to 0. They fix the epsilon. That's interesting. So you don't have such a wild, I mean, such a dramatic uh, quantity like the total variation, integral of gradient of uh, great, great gradient of u. So they fix epsilon. They do, their, they do their minimization, and they take the u epsilon as the denoised image. But still, it's good to know that there is a whole scale. And uh, you know it's like a Boltzmann uh, versus uh, Navier-Stokes, Euler, UN. It's good to know. It's just gratifying to know that you have a continuous scale and that when you let some parameter go to, to 0, then you get the, uh, the other model. OK, now there is an, another model which is uh, extremely popular. In fact, it's one of the oldest models, but still it's very popular and there were lots of improvements. And look at that. I was very surprised when I saw this uh, used. It's exactly our lambda delta. It's called the Yaroslavsky neighborhood filter. It's exactly the type of thing that we had. Uh, there was no delta because, as I said, you don't let delta go to zero. It doesn't want. So delta is fixed, usually a small thing. And that's, uh, and it's this function. So Yaroslavsky had introduced those in uh, 85 with the function phi, which is either phi 1 or phi 2. In fact, phi 2 is, uh, is used a lot, and there are lots of, uh, lots of variants. And the w is, w is a weight function that they used. Uh, Yaroslavsky originally used uh, w to be, could be identically equal to 1, this weight function or a cutoff function. W of x minus y is 1 when x minus y is when x and y are closed, and uh, 0 when x minus y is large. Okay. Now, the name uh, neighborhood filter uh, comes from the fact that um, the, uh, no time really to explain, but roughly speaking, when you take delta to be z go to 0, you do your integral, you push your integral back into the region where u of x is very close to u of y. Okay? That's why they call this neighborhood. But it's not neighborhood in the sense that x is close to y. It's u of x, which is close to u of y. And when they explain this, they say the difference between the two types of filters is a little bit like taking the Riemann integral, which would be taking dividing the interval u of x, x, the x interval into small pieces, versus the Lebesgue integral, where you cut in, uh, in the range of u. So this is, this is, roughly speaking, a Lebesgue model for those, uh, for those things. And uh, now you see, when I saw this, I was delighted. And I was telling the, I was telling the guys in uh, image processing, uh, well, why don't you take 
uh, w of x minus y equals the one that uh, is 1 over x minus y to the n plus 1, because this one is choice is extremely natural in view of the fact that what we know now is that as delta goes to zero, it converges to the total variation. And now indeed they are doing a numerical and process of doing nu numerical computations. And uh, what, uh, and I'll, I'll finish with that. You see, up to now, there was no rigorous analysis whatsoever for proving, for example, that the minimizer with this Yaroslavsky filter exists. Because existence is usually done, functional analysis, you have convex functional existence. Here it's absolutely not clear what are the tools that you might use. There is no convexity inside, no compactness. For, for the ways, for example, uh, W is identity is one, there is no compactness, so there is no reason why this infimum should be achieved. Also, what is very funny is that they had not, people in image processing had not realized that there is the, the Yaroslavsky filter and the Roth filter, if you take this weight function properly, they converge that the Yaroslavsky filter converges. And they were very surprised when I was telling them, you know, if you put this weight function, uh, and from the point of view of uh, numerical computations, apparently the weight function does not play. Uh, this weight function that we, that we chose, in fact, could only help. But uh, they were very surprised. They say, oh, well, really, the, at, the, at this stage, uh, image processing was so empirical that everyone was throwing, uh, was throwing a, a filter and saying, I'm, uh, my filter is better than yours, etc." And uh, we are telling them, oh, they said, oh, it's uh, really very curious that the, uh, uh, the, the Yaroslavsky filter converges to the, uh, converges to the, uh, the, Roth, the Roth model. So here's my last uh, transparency. Uh, what we can prove at this stage. So those are basically the first kind of uh, rigorous statement for the uh, Yaroslavsky type filter. We take the function phi uh, to be, for example, like in Yaroslavsky, phi 1, phi 2, but we introduce this weight function 1 over x to the 1 over x minus y to the n plus 1. Then we can show that a minimum exists, and that's non-trivial because of lack, again, lack of convexity. We have to use instead a compactness, kind of delicate compactness, uh, compactness argument. Of course, there is no uniqueness because uh, functionals are not convex, and the u delta converges to u zero, which is the minimizer, the unique minimizer of the Roth where we have this constant k is the constant k which appears in the gamma convergence theorem. So we better have a k which is uh, strictly positive. But for example, phi 1 and phi 2, we know that uh, the constant k is uh, strictly positive. So you see here, this is an application already of the uh, gamma convergence theorem, which I, which I, mentioned, uh, which I mentioned earlier. OK, so I think I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm not the right person. <laughs> yeah, you should uh, you should talk to. Me. There are a lot of uh, really experts. It's uh, it's a major industry, and I'm not. Uh, uh, I cannot quite understand how they choose this. At this stage, it's very uh, it's very empirical. Uh, it's a it's they try, they try different things and they see what comes out. Yes, that's exactly the kind mm -hmm. of uh, kind of things where you see computing. Uh, 
com you compute first and then <laughs> and you try to uh, 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 scientific computing. At this stage, they are just doing. Uh, they are yeah. just doing. Yes, uh, and uh, it's time to put some uh, to bring in some uh, some kind of uh, more rigorous analysis. I think it is, but uh, but it's a major industry, and uh, apparently things are working because the images that you see on your uh, on your cell phone or whatever are good, uh, but they use this kind of uh, they use those kind of uh, they use those kind of filters. So, uh, but at this stage, uh, I, I must say this is uh, piece that I know of the first first kind of uh, rigorous type of uh, yeah. Now there are, there are methods which are are kind of which have been developed. For example, how do you minimize? Okay. You want to have a minimizer. Usually, the, minim the minimization process is achieved by a gradient flow. Yes, exactly, by gradient flow. And that's where you end up seeing lots of gradient flows, uh, which involve, uh, you know, the uh, divergence of the gradient of u divided by the modulus of the gradient of u, which is the gradient, which would be the gradient flow associated with the. Exactly. Exactly. They they are they are they are gradient flow. They are gradient flow, and uh, and mathematicians have started to look at those uh, to look at this gradient flow. But uh, well, truly minimize. It's probably too expensive. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Anyway, there is room for mathematicians in this uh, in this field. 